Seven leaders pledge additional 870 million COVID-19 vaccines for developing countries. Benjamin Netanyahu voted out of office after 12 years in power. Plus, former Zambian president and Pan-Africanist Kenneth Kaunda dies at the age of 97. These are just some of the stories coming your way in the course of the program. Welcome to Global Updates. I am Ekene Ndulwe. Let's get the ball rolling with the G7 summit that was held in the United Kingdom. G7 leaders at the summit pledged to provide COVID-19 vaccines for developing countries, a promise to make large corporations pay their fair share of taxes and a plan to tackle climate change. How important is the G7 summit and what impact will its resolutions have on the global scene? The G7, as you know, it groups uh, seven countries, seven industrialized countries. Uh, it was formed in the 1970s in response to uh, you know, certain challenges in the global economic situation, particularly in terms of harmonization of interests and the way the evolution of capitalism was going at that time so that uh, these countries can now reduce competition uh, among themselves and see where common interests will prevail and also purportedly to address global challenges to deal to do with uh, fair trade, with investments, equitable distribution of resources and so forth. So uh, it was set up actually as a sort of an enlightened self-interest policy by the developed countries. Later it included uh, an additional country that is uh, Russia when it came out of the Soviet era and uh, the Western countries opened up to it. But because of exigencies of politics, I, I think Russia withdrew or it found itself not particularly welcome in that grouping. So it went back to its uh, G7 configuration. So that is the brief history uh, of the group. It comprises, as you know, of uh, Western countries plus Japan. Uh, Italy, France, Canada, the United States, Germany, United Kingdom, you know, so seven of them, to form uh, the, 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 the group as it stands today. Let us not be over-optimistic. It's not going to have a dramatic impact on the global scene uh, for two reasons. Firstly, the G7, its economic cloud globally has drastically reduced their significance has changed, not for the better, but actually has diminished. According to uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs of the Columbia University in, in the United States, in 1980, the uh, G7 accounted for about 51% of the global GDP. Asian countries, the developing countries plus uh, China, Ex, ex, except or minus Japan, accounted for only 8.8% of global GDP. But today, the G7 account for a mere 31% of global GDP, while the Asian countries plus China account for 33% of global GDP. So in this respect, the economic significance in terms of leverage over economic issues globally has reduced. So whatever comes out of their meeting will be marginal to specific areas and specific issues, but not of any global ramification, because 
Their decisions will not affect Russia, for instance, which is a vast and important country. It will not affect significantly the African continent. It will not significantly affect the Middle East. And it will not affect China. G7 actually address uh, issues of significance to Africa, but uh, I don't know if actually Africa will take note of these issues. For instance, they have pledged to inject about $650 billion into the International Monetary Fund as part of its Special Drawing Rights, or SDR, whereby they will support structural adjustments and other macroeconomic policies in Africa and other developing countries. So I will urge the Minister of Finance and the Central Bank to go through the 27-page communique issued at the end of the G7 meeting and to look specifically at paragraph 68 that address African issues, where these matters were highlighted, to see how the policies of the Nigerian government, for instance, can be aligned to the aims and objectives of the communique in terms of supporting Africa, particularly in the health area and also in growing the SMEs in Nigeria and also perhaps in advocating for infrastructure development. The whole thing is to catch up with China, actually. You know, China is injecting billions of dollars into Africa. So how can the West match China and even reduce or drastically push back the influence of China? So I think Nigeria should pay attention to the 27-page uh, communique, paragraph 68, as I said. The other issue is actually they want to actually uh, spend about 80 or 85 million dollars uh, you know, on supporting private sector capacity building in Africa. Let our private sector, the organized private sector, look into that and engage through the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Nigeria, through the CBN and the Minister of Finance, how they can access and leverage those facilities towards actually recalibrating and reforming their access to foreign finance to develop the private sector, particularly our industrialization, which has suffered greatly in the last 20 or 30 years. Thank you, Ambassador Saraki, for your valuable insights there. Let's take a breather here and go for a quick break. We will be right back. Let's blow your trumpets. Advertise on NTA News 24, located at the headquarters premises of the NTA, Area 11, Pergi, Abuja. Our rates are affordable. Our reach is far and wide. We are on DSTV Channel 419, Star Times Channel 101, Go TV Channel 46, Free TV Channel 703. NTA News 24. News and more news. Welcome back. And if you've just tuned in, the program is Global Updates, where we bring you up to speed with events in the past week. And now to Israel. 13th June 2021 marked the end of an era 
in the country where after 12 years as Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu was voted out of office by the narrowest of margins, 60 to 59. In his place, the parliament chose a coalition government to be led by the conservative and centrist parties. Even excluding his first three year stint as Prime Minister in the late 1990s, Benjamin Netanyahu was Israel's longest serving leader and he so dominated Israeli politics that it was difficult to imagine that anybody could ever replace him. Indeed, it took four elections over two years and the collaboration of eight opposition parties to finally remove him from office. The effort required is a testament to his unmatched survival skills in a political system that requires endless maneuvering just to stay in place. His policies of privatization, deregulation, tax cuts, bureaucratic reductions and banking reforms did much to boost economic growth and fund the rise of Israel's high-tech juggernaut, even though they increased inequality during his tenure. A million new jobs were created, GDP grew by 50% and exports doubled. And although he bungled the management of the COVID-19 pandemic early on, he did secure an impressive number of vaccines and distributed them quickly. Benjamin Netanyahu also parlayed Israel's formidable intelligence capabilities, military prowess, and reputation as the startup nation in a prominent role for his country on the world stage. Relations with India, China, Russia, Africa, and Latin America burgeon, so did strategic cooperation with Arab states. Although he ruptured relations with neighboring Jordan, Netanyahu's crowning achievement was the normalization of relations with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan and Morocco under the umbrella of the Abraham Accord signed in 2020. Let's head to the African continent now, where food prices in Zimbabwe are expected to drop or at least remain stable Following a successful agricultural season, we saw an increase in availability of most farm products in the local market. Treasury has instituted measures to contain inflation, which has borne some fruits with year-on-year -year inflation drastically declining over the last 12 months. The successful 2021 agricultural season is expected to further harness this trajectory on the back of increased availability of food products on the local market. According to the president of the Confederation of Zimbabwe Retailers, Mr. Denford Mutashu, food prices as the biggest contributor to inflationary movements. Hence, this bumper harvest will help to arrest any likely price increases. Another economist, Mr. Titus Mukove, expects inflation to reach double-digit figures in the coming months, adding that stable food prices will help to achieve that. What was actually the major concern uh, for food inflation in the past two years with successive uh, droughts that the economy actually experienced, as well as climatic shocks such as uh, cyclone, cyclone Ida. So this agriculture season, we are seeing supplies increasing, uh, and this is actually helping slowing down the, 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 the food inflation. And thanks to the government value chain support systems that have been put in place, as well as support that has been done to the agriculture sector. Zimbabwe's inflation, which reached a record high of 837.53% in 2020, continues to recede and currently stands at 168% as of May as strategies to arrest the spiraling inflation rates continue to be successful. Although many street children exhibit incredible resilience in the face of hardships, health experts and psychologists say their sense of well-being is generally low. This is because stigma and discrimination takes a heavy toll on them. This special report from Ghana explores the hardships and discrimination street children face. Street children are a majority when it comes to children facing difficult hardships. The World Health Organization estimates that there may be approximately 100 million street children around the world. Their homeless lifestyle 
makes them more vulnerable to mental health risks and its associated problems than children who live at home. This is because they roam the streets, begging for food and money for basic needs, and then sleep in uncompleted buildings, abandoned basements, under bridges, in front of stores and shops, auto-fitting workshops, and in the open air. Mental illness has no age limit. Children and young people around the world, rich and poor alike, are experiencing it. This is the silent emergency of our time, and it requires urgent attention and innovative strategies. It requires research and expertise. It requires a better understanding of the causes and development of mental illness. A number of studies have shown that street children are exposed to polyvictimization, which includes various types of physical abuse, sexual violence, bullying, and exposure to violence, neglect, and drug abuse. Eventually, these conditions put the children through severe mental health problems. A study I conducted on street children in Accra, Kumasi and Chakrad revealed high level of he mental health needs among these children. 73% recorded moderate to severe mental health disorder and 90% had poor quality of life. That's to be expected, right? According to the WHO, there are various levels of social interventions for street children. These include introduction of partnership projects for agencies that have a common goal to deal with streetism and also ensuring that appropriate services and resources are available to street children. Ultimately, the focus must be on changing or influencing the life of the street child. Still in Ghana, the Mion District Assembly has inaugurated an environmental management committee to address the growing menace of environmental degradation. The project comes at a time the district is struggling to control harmful environmental practices, particularly indiscriminate cutting of trees for charcoal production and bush burning. Cutting down trees for charcoal burning and bushfires is common in the northern region. Hundreds of acres of forest cover are lost due to these environmentally harmful practices. Bushfires, in particular, are rampant in the area, destroying hundreds of acres of farms annually. The Mion District Assembly says bushfires remain a major drawback to efforts to boost food security reduce household poverty and increase employment among the youth in the district. Last year, a middle-aged woman died in the area through bushfires, while hundreds of acres of farms were also destroyed. The chief of Sakuya, Sintaro Mahama, lost over 300 acres of maize and soya beans. He described the inauguration of the Environmental Management Committee as a bold step in the fight against environmental degradation, especially bushfires. This is long overdue in terms of launching an environmental management committee to ensure that the existing bylaws are enforced. The laws are there. And with the enactment of the law and the commissioning of the environmental management committee, I think this is going to go a long way in ensuring that environmental sustainability looking after our environment and those who are involved in the menace of bush burning, uh, wildlife hunting, charcoal burning and indiscriminatory felling will be thing of the past. The project is a collaboration between the Catholic Relief Services and the Mion District Assembly. The country representative of the CRS, Daniel Mumuni, said the rise in global temperatures remain a major security threat and called for collective efforts to address this menace. The success of all this will also hinge on the implementation of the bylaws of the Assembly. We must start with education and engagement, but we must also follow it up with enforcement of the bylaws. The Northern Regional Minister, Al-Haji Shaibul Ahasan Sani, highlighted the role of education use of improved agricultural practices and enforcement of bushfire laws. 
we cannot succeed without an improved uh, behavioral change. We need to change our behaviors and practices all across. I humbly wish to appeal to the district assembly, traditional authorities, and all other stakeholders gracefully represented here to continue to collaborate effectively with each other to ensure the realization of the greening Ghana, something His Excellency the President is very keen on and wants to see a very green Ghana. Stakeholders jointly planted some trees to symbolically mark the inauguration of the committee. And now on a sad note, Zambia's former president, Kenneth Kaunda, the father of the country's independence, who ruled for 27 years, has died. He died at the age of 97 of pneumonia at a military hospital where the 97-year-old had been receiving treatment. Kenneth Kaunda led Zambia into independence from Britain ruling the country from 1964 to 1991. He was also instrumental in assisting other Southern African countries gain independence from minority rule. KK, as he was affectionately known, was born at Lubon Mission, then Northern Rhodesia, the youngest of eight children of a Church of Scotland minister. Kaunda was a teacher by training like his parents. He was at the forefront of the struggle for independence, first joining Northern Rhodesian African National Congress in 1951. He became Zambia's first president at independence from Britain in 1964. He ruled the country for 27 years. Kaunda was all his life a staunch pan-Africanist. In 1968, he declared Zambia a one-party state. He is also credited with having had a negative impact on Zambia after partially nationalizing the mining industry, the backbone of the country's economy. Kawunda attempted a political comeback in 1996, but was barred on constitutional grounds. In his later years, the elderly statesman dedicated his time to charity work, particularly the fight against HIV and AIDS. He has received, amongst his many accolades, eight honorary degrees and the Order of the Companions of O.R. Tambo in 2002. A very sad news there of an icon, one of Zambia's founding fathers, global statesman. May his soul rest in peace. Let's take a look at other stories that made headlines in the past week. Do stay with us. Nigeria's envoy to Italy, Ambassador Umfawa Omini Abam, has officially presented his letter of credence to the president of Italy, Sergio Mattarella. A statement by the envoy said, the presentation of the letter occurred at the Quirinian Palace in Rome. He said the presentation of the letter marked the start of another phase of diplomatic operations between Nigeria and Italy in the aviation and economic sectors as well as the political front. According to the envoy, discussions on ways to increase the volume of trade and ensure resumption of direct flights between the two countries had begun. He also said efforts were being made to take the discussions to higher levels. Well, that's the much you can take on this edition of Global Updates. Until we come your way next time, continue to observe all safety protocols against COVID-19. I am Ekene Ndulwe. Bye for now.